let x and g be elements inside of a group g. Then we're going to denote the element little g as a superscript on the left of x. Uh, that's going to be defined to be g, x, g inverse. Now, from a text uh, LaTeX type situation, this is kind of an awkward little symbol here because superscripts usually should go on the right. This actually looks like uh, caret g and then there's space X, right? It's kind of weird. Now you have to be careful. If there's anything over here, you, the, the, this little carrot's gonna wanna attach to that. So you have to be very careful that there actually is a legitimate space. Um, so if you had some other symbol, like say H over here, you might have to put like a backslash with a blank to make sure it doesn't attach the thing right here. It's a really annoying thing to do in LaTeX. Superscripts and subscripts on the left are not uh, well used. And actually it's, I think the main reason why the group theorists don't like this notation here, but uh, but nonetheless, this element superscript G X is defined to be G X G inverse. This is called the con. This is a conjugate of X with respect to G. Okay, and honestly, this is what one calls a left conjugate, uh, which I'll talk some more about that in just a second. If we take the set of all conjugates inside of G, all conjugates of X, this is denoted as capital G sub X. And this is called the conjugate class of X, for which uh, the reason why we call it a conjugate class is that, well, it turns out conjugation forms an equivalence relationship. So if X, say, equals, so if two things are conjugates of each other, what does that actually mean? Um, so if Y is a conjugate of X, that means there exists some element G, so, such that GX, G inverse is equal to Y. This is what we mean by x twiddle y right here there exists and that's the wrong e there exists some little g inside of the group so this happens so x and y are conjugates of each other this is an equivalence relationship it's reflective uh reflexive it's symmetric and it is transitive okay so this gives you these these consciously classes turns out you could define conjugation a little bit differently uh one and this is actually in my opinion the more common way of defining it uh, you could define x to the g as actually G inverse X G like so. And then the corresponding uh, consciousy class of X, you would actually denote as X to the capital G. And so this is gonna be the set of all elements X to the G where G ranges over G like so. And so in my opinion, this is the notation that's used most often. Now it could be because in terms of LaTeX, it's so whole, a, a whole lot easier to denote this, just write it here. Um, X caret G or something like that. But it turns out there actually is a big, uh, a big conversation about the left convention, which we see right here. So this idea, this is known as the left convention. And you kind of see that with how we denoted it. The little G is on the, on the left there, convention. And over here in blue, we get the so-called right convention. And it turns out prior to this video, if you've been following along with this lecture series, we've seen this already before, all this left and right. Uh, so you have like left cosets versus right cosets, right? Which one do we talk about? Do we do right cosets or left cosets? Uh, do we do left translation versus right translation? Which one should we do? Um, and so when it comes to these conjugates, this left and right convention comes into play. Now these differences of conventions give slightly different interpretation of things like cosets and conjugates and translation, but it develops all the same theory, right? Uh, like for example, when it comes to these consciousy classes, if you take the left consciousy classes, this is actually the same thing as the right consciousy class. Conjugation is, it, 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 the, the conjugates, whose conjugate to X is independent whether you're doing left conjugation or right conjugation. And so some of these small little things make no difference whatsoever, right? The difference between left conjugation and right conjugation is analogous to this difference between left cosets and right cosets and left translation versus right translation. I said that. There's no difference between the theory of left cosets and the theory of right cosets. Like for example, if you take the number of left cosets, this is equal to the theory of right cosets. Uh, go the other way around, like so. Uh, it, it makes no difference which one you use, and that's what we define to be the index of the group, right? Because it doesn't make a difference which one you use over the other. Um, so how does one actually make a decision then? So in this, in this lecture series, we're gonna use the left convention as the dominant convention. I say that because there are some situations where we have to talk about left things and right things at the same time, so we can't ignore it entirely. Uh, 
So we're gonna use the left convention as these notations are gonna be derived from the fact that we write functions on the left. So uh, in the United States, the most common way of writing a function is like f of x, where the function's on the left and the input is on the right. In other places in the world, um, it's actually quite common to write the function on the right. So you might write something instead as like x of f like that, or, or probably you'd see more often x and superscript uh, f right there. So that's kind of like what we're seeing right here, that the, the, the element g is kind of acting like a function on the input element x. And so that's the main difference be, of those things, right? But be aware that though there are many times, there are many, I, I should say, there are many times where left and right conventions must interact. So we can't just ignore them in general. Or we have to, we can't, we can pick one convention, but we have to be aware of both. Uh, like for example, normal subgroups are those subgroups for which left cosets are equal to right cosets. So there's something special about normal subgroups because it's where like things come together. If I, if I dare make a political, uh, a political uh, analogy in this video right here. You know, normal cosets are those bipartisan, uh, so excuse me, normal subgroups are those bipartisan subgroups. That's where left and right come together and there's no disagreement, which is again kind of ironic because in the United States, uh, that behavior is not what I would call normal. Uh, I know that was a horrible pun, but but um, there's my there, there it is for you. Uh, so most of the most of the interactions will be the study of group actions. That is, when it comes to like this left and right, this this is a big deal when one talks about group actions, which is not something we're going to worry about in algebra one. This is something we'll get more into in, in abstract algebra two, math forty two thirty. Okay, so you should be aware of both conventions. That's the thing I really want you to get away from from this conversation here. Um, and so some other things to mention here. Uh, I should also want to mention that the study of consciousness class is getting back to the idea here of conjugation here. Uh, the study of consciousness class is an important part of group theory. Uh, for example, uh, let's see, I, I've doodled all over my page, so I need to come down for a little bit. Uh, so if we were to, you know, look at the element superscript GX right here, what happens when that's equal to X itself, right? Well, that would mean that gx g inverse is equal to x, which if you multiply on the right by x, you actually get that gx equals xg, right? Okay, so an element is equal to its own conjugate when you are actually, when you commute with the conjugator, okay? And so when you see something like x, uh, g, gx here is equal to just x itself, this would suggest that x commutes with everything. Um, which in group theory, we'd say that X is central, right? Central because it belongs to the center of the group. This is denoted ZG. This is the set of all elements Z inside the group, such that ZG equals GZ for all G inside of G, right? So when, so you're, you're central exactly when your conscious class is yourself, right? And it turns out, this center, this center group, it can be proven, I'm not going to do it right here, that the center is always a normal subgroup. So this is a pretty important group, and the constant class being trivial actually means the element is central. Uh, another important element, all right, to talk about is what we call a commutator. So let's say we take something like g comma x right here. This is defined uh, to be gx, g inverse x inverse. Now you have to be careful because with the right convention, when you see the commutator gx, this is actually defined to be g inverse x inverse gx. So a slightly different definition, but it doesn't make much of a difference here. Uh, you'll notice that this commutator, this looks like gx times x inverse. And the, the use of commutators also is a very important tool uh, to the, the, the use of commutators is an important tool also to measure commutivity, right? Because if if a commutator turned out to be, if a commutator turned out to say be the identity, right? That would suggest that gx g inverse uh, is the identity, which if you multiply on the right hand side by x inverse uh, by x and g, excuse me, you end up with the statement that x g equals gx. So a commutator being trivial. Uh, is again is equivalent to being a, the uh, commuter. Uh, that is your your your, your you, these two elements commute with each other. That's why it's called a commutator. Uh, an important group in group theory, a subgroup. It's called G prime. This is known as the commutator subgroup. This is going to be the subgroup generated by all of the commutators, 
right, where G and X range over the elements of group right here. So this is the subgroup generated by commutators. There could be things in the subgroup that are not commutators, but they're going to be products of commutators and things like that. It turns out that the commutator subgroup is also a normal subgroup of G. And it kind of these two subgroups measure how abelian something is. Like if you have an abelian group, the trivial are the the center of a of an abelian group is going to be everything, and the commutator subgroup is going to be nothing, right? Uh, the, the identity because everything would commute. And so again, I'm really trying to emphasize here that the, these uh, conjugates are a pretty big deal when it comes to group theory, right? Coming back to a previous theorem, we said, oh no, it's still messy. But you'll see right here what I just erased, right, about the about the conjugate. You can talk about the conjugates of a subgroup. And so one equivalent form to being a normal subgroup is that normal a subgroup is normal if and only if it's closed under conjugation. So we say that a subgroup is normal if and only if for all G inside of G and N inside of N, we have that G N G inverse is inside of N. So a subgroup will be closed under multiplication, it'll be closed under the identity, it'll be closed under inverses, but the normal subgroup has this extra operation of conjugation, that normal subgroups are closed under conjugates. Uh, and that's what makes them a little bit extra special. Let's look at an example of such a thing. Okay, so in S3, the three conjugates, it has three conjugates. You have the identity, you have the three cycles, one, two, three, and one, three, two, and you have the, uh, the, the, the transpositions, one, two, one, three, and two, three. And I'll leave it up to you to check and verify these conditions right here. But if you look at all the possible conjugates of like the element one, two, right, there's six possible conjugates. You go over the elements of the group here. You're going to see that uh, two of the conjugates turn out to be one, two. Basically, uh, I'll, again, I'll let you compute that. Two of the conjugates turn out to be one, three, and two of the conjugates turn out to be two, three. Um, in the dihedral group, D4, right, the conjugate, the, the conjugacy classes are going to be the identity. You're going to get R2. This is because R2 here is central. So is the identity. The identity is always central. Um, R and R3 are conjugates of each other. S and R squared S are conjugates. And RS, R cubed S are conjugates of each other. In the alternating group A4, the... Consciously classes turn out to be the identity. You have the two two cycles. Uh, they form a they form a consciously class. And one thing I want to mention is if you put these things together, the identity plus the two two cycles, this actually gives you a four, the Klein four group. Now you'll notice here that the Klein four group is actually a normal subgroup of a four because the Klein four group is actually a union of conjugacy classes. That means a V4 will be closed under conjugation inside of A4. So therefore it is a normal subgroup. Normal subgroups are those subgroups which can be partitioned using conjugacy classes. Um, the other two conjugacy classes are the three cycles. There's eight three cycles in A4, but they're broken up into two groups. You have uh, one, two, three, one, three, four, one, four, two, 1, 4, 2, and 2, 4, 3. Then there's their inverses. The inverse of 1, 2, 3 is 1, 3, 2. The inverse of 1, 3, 4 is 1, 4, 3. The inverse of 1, 4, 2 is, is 1, 2, 4. And then the inverses of 2, 4, 3 is 2, 3, 4. This is a very interesting property about consciousy classes. If you take the inverse set of a consciousy class, you always get back a consciousy class. Now, that's not so exciting for these sets right here because the inverse set is itself, right? Uh, but when it comes to A4, these two sets right here, are actually, uh, these two sets, this one and this one, they're actually different sets and they're inverses of each other. That always happens. Uh, if you have some consciousy class, say GX right here, and you take its inverse, that is to say, this will just be, this will just be the consciousy class of the inverse elements. Pretty cool property. And we'll talk some more about uh, conjugates, of course, in the future, but this introduces you to the idea of a conjugate. For abelian groups, we don't really care about conjugates because the conjugates in an abelian group are always singletons because every element is central. Uh, but for non-abelian groups, studying the conjugacy class is a very important uh, measurement of the group.